We are live, probably. And <laughs> welcome to Truth Seekers. We are the disciples of Yahweh in Christ. We have a special guest tonight, and we're going to be talking about Darwinism and other related issues, evolution, you know. Uh, so welcome. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for your likes and subscribes and your support. We thank you for your prayers and blessings and all the comments that you put in our videos. We do read them. We do appreciate them. Appreciate all you guys. So here now to introduce our speaker is Brother Jody. Well, I'm glad uh, that we can have this special guest. Uh, we've been trying to connect the dots or we could uh, get him on. Uh, it was either not good for him or not good for us. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about our story. Uh, I met Dave in at uh, Charlotte, North Carolina at the Bible Museum. He had all these great ancient, uh, you know, Bible uh, pages from like Bibles from the you know, 14, 15, 16, I, I think maybe even a 1200. I can't remember the oldest one. And we got to talking and I found out that he was a previous atheist. I was yeah. like, wow, that's amazing. Now, and I got him, uh, you know, I said, what, what got you to come to faith in God or what got you to see the light? And, you know, he told me his story back then and you get to hear part of it today. So I'm looking forward to that again uh, because he's become a great man of God. And he went with the evidence. And I think the evidence to show that there's a divine creator is beyond a reasonable doubt. And I, I want to, um, and he's going to show you a lot of the evidence uh, for this. So let me introduce you to Brother Dave Glender. What's up, Jody? Scott, Jody, thank you for having me, man. It's a, it's a, it's a privilege and an honor to be here. I'm excited about it. Feels like we've been trying to plan this for like four years. Oh, we didn't even have a, a, a YouTube channel four years ago. So <laughs> said, timing like worked out perfectly. That's <laughs> perfect timing. Amen. Amen. No, thank you for having me on, man. I, I really appreciate it. All right. So uh, one thing I would like to hear some of your story, Dave, of how you came out of atheism. Amen. Well, and that's, I kind of want to start with like, you know, so, so what were, uh, kind of focused on tonight is, is Darwin versus Moses. And, you know, both of them, uh, Moses obviously wrote about creation back in, in Genesis. Darwin didn't exactly mm, talk about creation in that sense, as far as getting down to, you know, a biogenesis when neither did Moses, he talked about general creation and a lot of Darwin's statements um, in the Holy Bible origin of species. Um, they're kind of creation related. So uh, years ago, I think it was Mike Lacona, who uh, I've known him for years and he wrote a book called uh, Paul versus Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And what he yeah. did, he, he put them on a virtual stage where they debated each other, you know, and I like that kind of like going back and forth. Like you said this, you said that. And so when I really started thinking about it, I was like, what if we put Darwin and Moses on a stage and said, okay, you guys present your case, but see, here's the thing we're in the 21st century and, and now we have microscopy. We have all these different sciences available to us to test what each one of them said to see which one makes the most sense. And so, um, and Jody, I like how you said, like, you know, I'm, I, my, my favorite part recently was I was in Nigeria and there was a uh, school, it was a private school, um, kids. And um, I wasn't just like America. I wasn't exactly allowed to just share the gospel per se, because it was a mixed group of kids. There was probably 50% Muslim, 30% uh, Christian, and 20% who knows where they're at. And um, the Muslims in Africa are totally different than here. Let me just tell you, Muslims here are very loose and um, not very not very heavy in their practices. Well, Muslims there are completely different, man. They're sold out. That was the first time I'd ever heard the call to prayer and all that stuff. So anyways, I'm sitting there and I'm sharing some stuff. And I just kept telling them, God loves you. And I'm not really that guy who's like, oh, oh, love you. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I say God loves you, but because I couldn't say, because Allah in their in their religion, Allah is too removed from that to actually experience a love of God, you know? And so I just kept telling him, I was like, you need to understand God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. And so finally, we hit a Q&A at the end. And this guy says, um, what made you land where you landed? Well, once you ask me a question, now I can answer freely. 
And so I was like, I'm glad you asked that question. And I just told him, I said, look, I'm not a Christian because I needed Christianity to be true. I'm not a Christian because I wanted Christianity to be true. As Jody said, I followed the evidence. I'm a Christian because all of the evidence led me to a conclusion that Christianity is the only one. And I'm an expert on Islam. I mean, I've studied Islam for years. I probably know more about Islam than most Muslims, at least in America, do because it's such an oral tradition that doesn't do a whole lot of study within their own within their own merits. Um, Christianity is the only one that made sense, man. At the end of the day, I I I, I held it over the so. Uh, a snippet of my testimony um, grew up Northeast, uh, you know, and, and there's just up in the North of uh, Connecticut and there's not a whole lot of Jesus there. And then I went to public school and they told me that, you know, Moses or uh, I'm sorry, Darwin figured it out. We don't need God. You know, we, we have rational explanations for how we got here and, and all that stuff. And so it was just never, God was never even on my radar at all. And it wasn't until I moved to Georgia, which is a Bible belt, you know, part of the Bible belt, that I realized that, man, I'm, I'm a militant atheist. I cannot stand these Christians. They drive me nuts. I can't, I just couldn't stand them. They were a bunch of hypocritical, dumb, idiotic, check your brain at the door. Don't actually think about anything people. And I just couldn't understand what an archaic people they were. Couldn't stand them. And um, so fast forward, um, I'm, I'm giving you like, we're going to the 12th floor in the elevator and I'm giving you the snippet version of it. Um, I end up, I've been doing drugs since I was six. Fast forward. I end up hooked on meth later on in life from 26 to 30. I got real hooked on meth and um, I was very, very, uh, I was done, man. I, I was a 105, 110, 120. I don't even know how I, I was. I had withered away to nothing and um, lost everything in my life, including my family that I had abandoned and blah, blah, blah. So I, which I'm still happily married. My son's awesome. My wife's awesome. God restored all of that. But at the time um, I was so empty, man. And I just, I honestly just wanted to kill myself, but I didn't have a gun at the time. And I was afraid that if I tried to jump in front of a truck, I would just end up like being a paraplegic and people would laugh at me for failing at failing. Or if I tried to overdose, I would end up in the hospital, get my stomach pumped. I was afraid to fail at failing. That's how low I was because listen to me, when they told me Darwin figured it out, where do you find hope? If there is no God, where do you find hope? Where do you find meaning? Where do you find value? Who do you turn to if there's nothing to turn to? If we're just two cosmic stars collided and all of a sudden, you know, non-life creates life and everything came from the process of evolution through natural selection, where do you find meaning and value and hope? And so, um, I, I went back to my house one night. I had, I had abandoned my wife and my son, but I went back to the house one night and she was reading this book called knowing Jesus personally. And I just started to mock the book. Like what kind of idiotic book are you reading? Are you an idiot? You know, here I am hundred and whatever, five, 10 pound meth addict trying to tell my wife, like, you know, what are you doing with your life? You're reading this stupid book, you know, and I wasn't looking at the mirror, but anyway, so I started to mock the book. I started to mock the idea of Jesus. I started to mock the idea of Christianity. I started to mock the idea of God. And finally I just turned around and I, then here was my altar call. I said, if you're God, do something about it. And, um, I, I, all I remember, it's, it's kind of foggy, but all I remember is waking up the next day and just, everything that made me who I was, was gone. And, and the meth addiction was gone and you don't walk away from meth. I mean, meth as you go through clinics, you go through methadone, which is another narcotic that helps bring you down. You don't just put meth down. It doesn't work that way. And so it, it just, everything that made me, me was gone. And so I had to find out who did it, which is part of the reason why I became an expert on Islam because I started studying Buddhism first and realized that Harlech Watama couldn't match up. Then I started studying Islam because they blew themselves up into buildings. And I don't see Christians with that much zeal. So I thought Allah must be the right one. And finally, my mother-in-law gave me a, a, a case for Christ. And um, when I read the historicity of Christ outside the Bible, it was just a game changer, man. And, and once I realized that, I started going, okay, what else don't I believe? And, um, and again, I'm not a Christian. I, I'm a Christian now because man, for the past 20 years, I've just seen things that I've seen, I've seen lives change. I've seen, I've just seen and experienced so many things with Christ that now I'm a Christian because man, you can't convince me of anything otherwise, just because of everything that I've experienced and seen. But back in the day for probably the first 10 years, I was a Christian because that's where the evidence led to. I wasn't a Christian because I wanted it to be true or needed to be true that's the only one that actually made any sense when you really examined it down at its core. Wow. That's what, great. What was yeah. the, 
Go ahead. What was the what was the evidence that was the strongest factor? You said the historicity of Christ was that the leading cause of you wanting to become a Christian? Absolutely, man. When I realized, I thought Jesus was just a myth. So mm-hmm. if he's just a mythological character or he's just some, even if he wasn't mythological, if he was just some sort of fabrication at any level, then what is there to take seriously? You know what I mean? Like I just, I grew up thinking that this idea of Jesus was something that somebody would, a character that somebody would want to emulate, you know, and, and that's, that's all I ever thought of. So when I got to the point where like, man, you can put down your Bible and you can find Jesus in first century history, but here's the thing. It's not just finding him in first century history. It's enemy testimony. It wasn't like they were Christians writing, Christian historians writing about him. There was Jews and Romans who were totally opposed to this new Christian faith and Christian faith coming out of Judaism because Jesus was a Jew and the apostles were all Jewish. This new sect of Judaism, which ended up becoming Christianity, they were opposed to it. So, man, when they were writing about Jesus and how he died, who he died by, the trial, the fact that they believed he was a miracle worker, the fact that they believed he raised from the dead, they met on a certain fixed day and they sang anthems to it as he was God and just all these different things. I was like, hold on a second. You mean he actually lived? Like Jesus was here? I ne- That never crossed my mind. And so when I got to that point, because remember something supernatural had happened to me that night that I said, if you're God, do something about it. And in my atheistic worldview, only natural is allowed. Only a natural explanation can explain everything that we see around us. And so all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, and I was 30 years old, I was just almost 30 years old when this happened. So I'm almost 30 years old. And for the first time in my life, I'm like, wait a second, something supernatural. I knew something supernatural had happened. Like what had happened to me wasn't normal. It wasn't, I couldn't explain it by regular means. And so I had to now all of a sudden research the supernatural and try and find which God did it to me because I didn't know which one had done it to me. And so I, I started studying Buddhism and Islam. And that's when I got a case for Christ, the historicity of Jesus. And that's when I was like, hold on a second, picked up the word and, and, and didn't <laughs> you know, a funny little snippet. I, my drug dealer, I would do, I would do meth on his, on his coffee table. And he kept telling me, you got to read the book of revelation, man. You got to read the book of revelation. My drug dealers telling me this because like the 12 tribes are returning. And of course I think this dude's just an idiot. You know, I'm like, what are you just give me my meth, you know? <laughs> so when I first, when I first got this inkling through the case for Christ, that Jesus is real, I read Revelation first because that's what my drug dealer is telling me to read. And I'm like, whoa, man. Oh, the whole book was like that. And I was like, whoa, man, the dragons and seven heads. And, ah, you know, <laughs> so after I got done with Revelation, I went back to the, the beginning of the New Testament because I didn't know anything about I, I wasn't going to church. I didn't have a pastor around. I didn't have a Christian around telling me anything. So I just went back to Matthew and I started to read that. And I was like, okay, now I understand grace and mercy and forgiveness. Like all these different things that I experienced in that moment that Christ saved me from myself. I now have skin to put around that because now I see grace and mercy and forgiveness and, and, and just all that different thing, his sovereignty. I, I'm beginning to see that. But a funny part is I read Matthew. Then I read Mark. I'm like, oh, all right. then I read Luke. By the time I got done with Luke, I looked at my wife. I said, why do I always keep reading the same thing over and over again? I didn't understand the nature of the four gospels. So I was just like, why do I keep reading? So then I just went back to Genesis. I was like, let me just go to the first page and start reading because I didn't understand the nature of the four gospels at the time. So I was like, it's the same story over and over again. What's the point of this? <coughs> That's after I read Revelation. But That's that funny. was yeah, that was the game changer for me. You read the Bible backwards, Revelation, and the Gospels, and Genesis. Right? Uh-huh. I didn't have way. a theologian around trying to tell me, you know. <laughs> and then I remember when we first went to church, and this lady invited me to Sunday school. And I'm listen, man. I'm still a, a I'm still a seasoned atheist skeptic who's new into this whole thing. And this lady invites me to a Bible study on Sunday morning, and I was like. I'm going to keep reading it for myself and figure out what it says before I go to some place where somebody tells me what it says. That was my answer. I was like, I want to figure this thing out, man. Let me, let me, let me, let me dig in here and figure it out. So. I wanted to ask you a question about what you said when you were in school as a kid, they told you Darwin had it all figured out. There's no need for God. Now, did they specifically say there's no need for God or did you just find that it followed logically? It followed logically. Yeah. I mean, if, if, 
if there's no, if I don't need food to eat, I'm not going to eat because it makes me fat and then makes me fat, makes my back hurt. And then I can't walk without getting out of breath. There's, there's like repercussions for eating. So if I don't need food to eat, the logical conclusion is I'm not going to eat it. When they told me that there is no God, when they told me there's no need for God in the sense that what they're teaching is the fact that we can explain everything around us naturally with, with purely naturalistic explanation without any need for pulling supernatural or pulling any extra explanations into it. What else you, as a kid growing up, what else are you going to lean towards except for, I don't need that. So if I don't need food, I'm not going to eat it. If I don't need God, because they told me how everything came about, then why would I even look for a God at all? You know, my, my, and so here's why I'm glad you kind of asked that question because here's the thing teach evolution in schools. I don't care. Like that's fine, but teach intelligent design, not creationism. That's, that's a different story. Teach intelligent design alongside evolution and let the student decide what they think makes the most sense because I wasn't given that option. I was only told one side of the story. Students to this day are told one side of the story. They don't get another option for how things may have come about. They're only dogmatically taught. That's why it cracks me up and be like, Christians are dogmatic. I'm like, are you kidding me? Look at the public <laughs> school system, man. You're dogmatically shoving this down their throat. And I, I do a lot of youth ministry. I, I don't pigeonhole myself into youth ministry, but man, my heart is just, I, I love the next generation coming up and want to want to get into their heads before I can, before they turn away. And, and I'm always telling them like, man, <sighs> When you go to the public schools and they're shoving this stuff down your throat and they're telling you, just remember this, remember the answer to this question on Friday, regurgitate it. You've got to critically think about it and you've got to ask yourself, why is what they're saying true or is it true at all? Because right now, if you go to school and a student goes to school and they're in class and they're like, hey, look, I need you to remember this answer because this is the correct answer. You're not allowed to have an opinion about it or ask any questions. I'm telling you, two plus two equals six. And you have to answer six on Friday's questionnaire or else you're going to fail that that question. You're going to fail the test. You're going to fail the grade. So two plus two equals six. I don't care what you think about it. And so the student has no choice. They're not given the question to say, wait a second, two plus two doesn't equal six. You can't do that when it comes to evolution. You just have to accept it on its merits for, because the teacher's saying it, because the textbooks are teaching it and you can't question it. And when you question it, you'll fail the test. And if you fail the test, you fail the grade. There's not an option given. I'm like, man, that's, that's not education. That's, that's brainwashing is what that is. Right. It's a public school indoctrination. And I had a similar experience. They, you know, as you say, in public school where I went, they didn't teach anything about God. There was nothing except the, you know, these explanations. They didn't also, they didn't say there is no God. They didn't come down one way or the other, but it, like you say, it just followed logically. And I, I remember one of the things that was around when I was growing up was a bumper sticker slogan that said, life sucks, then you die. (laughs) <laughs> and that was the, you know, that was the, the spirit of the age. That was the yeah. worldview that I was being absorbed in, in, in my elementary school. And was so hopeless. You know, you yeah. talked about, uh, you know, coming to the end of you know, having no hope, but where do you turn to? That's, that's kind of what was a similar experience that I had, but it took me longer to get there. Uh, I came to faith also quite late, just actually about 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I heard an echo of my own experience in that, you know, what I was taught didn't give me any options or any uh, foundation for, for living, for hope. It was life sucks, then you die. Yeah. And that was the worldview that I absorbed. And that, and that was mine. I used to say that I used to have that saying that if, if I could have tattooed it on me, I probably would have tattooed life sucks and then you die. Or, or no, if you, you want to get really secular with it. Life sucks and then you die or you marry one. That's 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 just how it was, man. That was back in that worldview. That's just how it was. But hey, let me let me can I play just a little segment of a of a video that I teach uh, kids and I'll and I'll show you I'll show you the I'll show you the way that we try and address this when it comes to this whole topic of of like man, you're not given a choice in this. So here's here's I'm gonna screen share. So we're gonna go here. I'm gonna go, let's see, I'm gonna go screen share. We're still learning how to do this. Technology has uh, has oh not that one here we go share that should uh she should be seeing a rock right yeah we see it 
All right. So here's here's what I tell kids. I'm like, look, man, I am a sucker for truth. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. And so I tell everybody <laughs> when when I've got a, a, a captive audience in front of me, I say, everybody, I'm going to teach you something. And if you don't remember anything else that I've shared with you this entire time, what I want you to do is I want you to remember this one thing. And I tell everybody, take a deep breath in, deep breath out. And then I show them this. It certainly is a big bun. It's a very big bun. Big fluffy bun. It's a very big fluffy bun. Where's the beef? Some hamburger places give you a lot less beef on a lot of bun. Where's the beef? At Wendy's, we serve a hamburger we modestly call a single. And Wendy's single has more beef than the Whopper or Big Mac. At Wendy's, you get more beef and less bun. Hey, where's the beef? I don't think there's anybody back there. You want something better. You're Wendy. So the reason why I play that is, you know, I, I get these kids that by the time I'm done playing it, they're laughing, but they're like, what did that have to do with anything? I'm like, think about it. You want me to buy your hamburger? What's the number one thing you should have on your hamburger? A hamburger patty. If you just sell me a bun, I'm not buying your hamburger. You know, if you sell me, if you, if that's what you give me is this big bun, a little beef patty, I'm not coming back to your restaurant. If you want me to buy your worldview, if you want me to buy the evolutionistic worldview, then you need to show me where I always tell them, like, say, where's the beef? And I get them to repeat that because I'm like, look, when you sometimes you read an article hey, here, here, you want me here? I'm going to share. I'm skipping around a little bit, but um, here's <laughs> I'm going to share an article with you and I want you to see what I'm talking about. All right. Share screen here. We're going to hit here, share, and then we're going to go play. So here, here is what I'm talking about when I say, where's the beef? I mean, we're in trouble right now. Egypt names 43 million year old walking whale after God of death. I mean, we're done. Like you can tell everything about that walking whale that it's transitioning from a land animal back into the ocean. It's feet and legs are starting to grow into more fin like they're starting to face backwards. Apparently it loves swordfish because it's getting a swordfish. So I love you go to these museums and it's like at two o'clock on a sunny day. They like to swim towards the West and eat blue fish. I'm like, how do you know that? Because here's the thing. Say, hey, say it with me. Say, where's the beef? And where's, where's the, beef? the beef? Here's the beef. This is what they've got. How did you take a little bit of a jaw, a couple of teeth, uh, maybe a couple of vertebrates? We're not really sure what those other things are. And you get all of that out of that to get a walking whale. Do you have any hips, feet, knees, bones, toes, or anything else? No, you got, you have nothing. And so when I, when I tell these kids, I'm like, look, man, here's the thing. When you, when you, when the whole where's the beef thing, it's to critically think. Don't just take what the teacher's telling you and say, Hey, regurgitate it on Friday. You're going to have to do that in order to pass the class. That doesn't mean you have to believe it or conceptualize it into your own brain and accept it as truth. When they tell you this is how it is, I want you to critically think and I want you to say, where's the beef? Where is the actual evidence? Because you can't tell me that you have this new walking whale when all you have is a piece of a jawbone, a couple of teeth, a couple of vertebrae, and we're not really sure what the other toothpicks hanging out there are. You can't get, you can't, you know what that is? It's called imagination. It's called fables. So when they're trying to sell you this stuff, but if, but listen, this generation, all they do is they read the headline. Oh my gosh, they found the walking whale. We're done. My faith is over. I'm no longer a Christian because they found walking whales. I'm like, did you read the article? The art here's what the article says, Scott. Maybe, possibly, could have been. Like all these different like words where it's like, did you find it or not? Because your headline said we found the missing link. And then when you read the article, possibly could have been, maybe transitionally possible, like. Did you or did you not? And so that's what we spend a lot of time in uh, in the ministry that I'm with is trying to teach kids how to think critically. And that goes for everything. I, I love the saying, be a Berean, because, man, the Bereans didn't just take what was being told to them. They went back to the scriptures to see if it matched up. They didn't just take the words of the apostles. They said, I love what you're saying. Seems to make sense. And I want it to make sense, but I've got to go back to the scripture and I've got to see if this lines up. It's called critical thinking. It's something that is an art that's been lost almost. Yeah. You know, when you talk about the way they sell evolution with these, these, these pictures, 
I think this is interesting. We live in a society where, you know, we have so much video, we have so much information, we have pictures of everything. There's cameras everywhere. Yeah. Yet when they come to a time to, to prove the Darwinian thing, they always have a drawing. Why do you yeah. get a drawing? Show me the picture. Show me like, you know, what you just did. Here's the fossil. Here's the fossilized remains that we have. Yeah. And, and this reminds me of, um, of uh, this book, Jonathan Wells' book, Icons of Evolution. Yeah. He goes through and shows all these things like this, you know, right here on the front of, uh, of the book, they've got a drawing. Is yeah. that a history? Is that based on some data evidence? Show me the evidence. They're not showing me all the, you know, the progression of fossils that, that, you know, lead from that ancestor to this modern creature. They're just showing me drawings. Yeah. And, you know, like Heckel's drawings, you know, they're still, they're still perpetrating this, this mythology with, with, with drawings rather than with photographic evidence or, or videos. This, this is, this is my favorite one that I share when I'm doing this uh, Moses versus Darwin one. And, and I, <laughs> this is, this is just classic. This is what you're going to get when you go into the, uh, into the museums and stuff. You know, this is Dr. Gingrich and found Pacacetus in 1983. It's the first, Pacacetus is the first walking whale. And the story goes, just to set it up a little bit, we came out of the water, we grew legs and we grew lungs, and then we got tired of being on the land and we crawled back into the water and our legs turned into fins and our lungs turned into uh, uh, gills. And so that's what we did. So you go into these museums or the textbooks and you get these drawings of this walking whale. And if you'll notice, the back feet are very for backward facing they've turned into fins the forward feet are are definitely fin like they're in their development of fin like and and again you get this um, two o'clock on tuesdays he likes to chase red fish to the west you know like you get this drawing well here's the thing this is all they found of pacacetus and the and the tinted areas are actually what they found the white areas are drawn in to fill in the blanks so so in 2001 an entire skeleton is found does that look anything like the thing on the left Nope. Not at all. No, this is what their rendition is, is this is Pacacetus. This is the this is the first walking whale right here. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, dude, that's not a whale. That's some sort of a, a wolf rat thing. And, and I'm and I'm at I'm in Atlanta at the museum. They have this big whale evolution exhibit. And, and <laughs> there's this husband and wife standing there looking at this thing. And it's and it's in its full form that they've had the model of, and, you know, it's 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 about the size of a medium dog. And all of a sudden they're like. They're like, wow, that doesn't look like a whale at all. Isn't that amazing that it's a whale? And I'm just thinking, bless your heart. Like, why do you buy that that's a whale? So I'm sitting there, I'm like, all right, apparently this is a whale. This Just so everybody can be educated who's watching, this is a whale. There's your prize. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, this is the stupidest thing in the world because it's not believable at all when you actually study the evidence. When you study the evidence, it makes them look really silly, but Scott, I believe that like, like for 30 years that ruled my life that man, they told me that's how it worked. And, and I'm just, and I feel like such a fool because of it, you know? Well, I'm so glad we're talking about this because evolution was one of the first things that started to, to uh, expose a chink in my own worldview and in a, a pry a wedge in that uh, the Holy spirit was going to use to bring me to faith. And, and the way it happened is I was actually investigating um, political issues and I read Ann Coulter's book, one of her books. And in the back, you know, it was, it was almost like an appendix. It was a later chapter, it, not so much about politics. She was debunking evolution. And I'm like, wait a second. Really? That's I can't, Yeah. I was like, you know, it's, it's like, what is this doing in a book on politics? But I think, you know, the, what, came, what I came away with is I can't trust these people who have been telling me these things. They're making this stuff up because I, you know, I checked it out. I didn't just take her word for it either. I went and did some investigation of my own. I realized this, this, this evolution story doesn't hold water. It's, it's not as strong as they claim it is. And yet they, they, they teach it dogmatically as if it's. Oh, true. absolutely. They, and, they and that's, teach it as, yeah. as, the, as the fundamental truth that supports oh. everything. Yeah. And that's what helped me, you know, call into question all these things I had been taught by authority figures and start to start to, you know, and do investigation for myself. So yeah. that was the beginning of, of part of my journey, you know, uh, to faith. So I, you know, I love this. I have lots of books uh, on, on Darwinism because that was one of the things that that's that started me on this Amen. path. Amen. That's not, it's, it's the, it was the thing that kept me from being a Christian. I, you said debunked. And, and so I just wanted to share this with you. You can go to, uh, mm. You can go to debunk.org or getdebunk.org, and part of our ministry at Reasons for Hope is um, we have a, a, a free app. You can go to Reasons for Hope and download the app, but we have a bunch of videos 
that um, they're three to five minutes long, super packed with uh, with information on on uh, everything from does God exist? Is there any evidence? And the, our latest one was CRT uh, is critical race theory biblical or not? Um, mm. That's that's something that that your your viewers can can check out. And man, it's it's there's a ton of it. Download the app because it's the easiest way to do it. It's on your phone. Type in reasons for hope. It's a black background with a blue asterisk. Everything we have on there is free. All the debunked videos are up there for free. It's it's we want the information to go out and get to the people. We don't we don't want the uh, the information not get out there. So when you said debunked, it made me think about that because that's that's a whole avenue that we travel down is just debunking these different ideas that are out there. But like right. I said, they're they're done they're done three to five minutes long because I know that people don't have an attention span and they're done real quick. Everything's fast paced. The text is flying in. Pictures are going in and out because we just realize that's the culture we live in nowadays. So. Great. I'll put that in the description box so people Amen. Can, Amen. can click on that and go there. Get debunked.com. That sounds good. Yeah. All right. So when it comes to Darwin versus Moses, let me put this up. I think you'll be interested in this, uh, Brother Dave. Which beard are you digging most? Who wore it well, shall we say? Um, you know, Moses looks like it's kind of like yarn so i'm gonna go i'm gonna go with darwin on this one i'm gonna give him the credit okay. for uh for the beard because moses looks like you ever seen undercover boss and they like yeah. put those fake that moses looks like he just got on undercover boss and he's going to uh to a company to see if he can expose him yeah because no darwin's got the he's got the classic uh grandpa beard going on there yeah. the, the santa claus grandpa beard yeah, when you zoom in, Heston's beard looks like a movie prop. That's <laughs> what that's what I'm kidding. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It's like it's a it's a it's a little much. <laughs> All right. So so when you talk about Darwin versus Moses, how you know how do you make that contrast when you're teaching you know the youth or or anybody? Well, what is so, the, what are those things you draw out? So I I pull in different things like um like Darwin's statements. Like I'll 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 share this with you. Let me over here share here um i pull out their statements like mm -hmm. this you know natural selection only acts by the preservation and accumulation of small inherited modifications each profitable to the preserved being and there's there's something that we need to understand that the uh there's a bad argument that says that um mutations which we observe I, as a christian i i acknowledge mutations that they happen all the time we see them and are they beneficial Sure, they might be profitable to the preserved being. Profitable doesn't mean that you're adding any new information, though. And so I, I pull this out of Origin of Species, where he talks about this preservation, because you got to understand mutations are accidental, blind, and unguided. And supposedly natural selection comes in and, and preserves only the, the modifications that are profitable to the preserved being. Well, Moses said this, cursed is the ground because of you, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat um, your food until you return to the ground since that's where you were taken from. And so we compare those two things and we say, okay, Darwin's saying that these mutu mutations happen over, over, you know, thousands and thousands and billions and billions of mutations happen. And these preservations happen that make that profitable, profitable to preserve being. But Moses is like, no, actually cursed is the ground because of you. Everything that we have is cursed because of what happened between Cain and Abel. So we've got two different statements going on. We've got one saying that it's going in the upwards direction, and we've got the other one that's saying it's going in the downwards direction. So I put this up and I'm like, look, if you're a microbiologist in here, forgive the simplicity of this, but you have to understand scientifically how a mutation works. And so we have this dog that's got LLSS. It's a genetic code that stands for long, long, short, short. And that's what the genetic code within that dog. Well, that dog has a, uh, a puppy and he moves over to Texas and he goes through a mutation or what I like to call an adaptation. Mm -hmm. And he loses one of the L's in that process of the mutation. And now he's got a shorter coat because he's in Texas and he's more comfortable. So he has a long and two shorts, which gives him a more comfortable coat. Well, this guy moves to Canada He's freezing. So he goes through an, a mutation or an adaptation. He loses one of the S's for the short hair. He's got more long hair components. So now he's got LLSS or LLS, which gives him a longer coat. And then this guy has a puppy and he moves to Mexico and he's burning up. He goes through another mutation or an adaptation, each one being beneficial because it's good to be comfortable where you're at. But did you notice what happened every single time? It comes at a cost. 
every single time an observable mutation happens, it comes at a cost. And remember, Darwin's trying to say that we went from goo to you, that we're on this that we're on this transitional link upwards, establishing a multicellular complex organism from a from a from a single cell amoeba in this in this you know bio, pre biological soup. He's saying natural selection is choosing upwards that it's profitable. But every mutation we observe in science comes at a cost, which is what Moses said, where he said, "Cursed is everything around you. Cursed is all of creation because of what you've done." And so we see within genetic mutations that there's actually a genetic loss of information. And so I pull in Richard Dawkins because we're commanded to always be ready to give a defense for anybody who asks you for the reason for hope that's within you. That's where we get apologetics from. Well, shouldn't he be ready to give a defense if he's going to write a book called The God Delusion, telling me and you that we're delusional if we believe in this God? And so I always play this because I'm like, look, he's asked the question directly, can you provide any evidence, a single evidence for information being added, which means that it's going in the direction that, 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 um, that, uh, uh, blah, 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 I got Dawkins stuck in my head. Uh, what is his stupid name? Most well, Darwin, that Darwin said, everything's going in this upward direction. Can you provide for me one single evidence of information being added to the genome and the mutational process? As a Christian, we should be ready to give a defense. As an atheist, especially if you're going to write a book called The God Delusion, you should be ready to give a defense. But look, pay very close attention to his words because his words get kind of tricky. You have to listen very closely to his statement to understand what he's saying. So check out his response. An example of a genetic mutation or, 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 or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? Can you just stop? Kind of awkward. And here, here's what he said afterwards. It was a kind of question only a creationist would ask. I'm sorry. <laughs> shouldn't we all be asking those questions? Mm -hmm. Again, shouldn't we all be critically thinking about this? And he, he goes on to say, in my anger, I refuse to discuss the question further and told them to stop the cameras. I'm like, dude, you weren't angry at all. I didn't see anger. What I saw was I saw confusion. I saw, I saw a lost man who couldn't answer the question. So that's what I do in the talk, Darwin versus Moses. I'm like, I want to compare their statements, look at modern science and see which one of them can add up. Now that we have the sciences available to us, did Darwin get it right or did Moses get it right? And I, and I go through probably about six or seven or eight. I can't remember how many I include in there where I'm like, let's break this process down and see now that we have the sciences available to us, who got it right? Because it's not something a creationist should be asking. It's a question. If, if all of eternity is based upon whether or not Moses got it right or Darwin got it right, we should be asking those questions. This isn't a light question we're asking as far as how did we get here? Yeah, it's interesting that Dawkins there is essentially saying there are questions you shouldn't ask. Yeah. So now which which faith system has become the dogmatic one? I, I know there's there's probably still Christians who are told don't ask that question, just believe. But we yeah, have but that's on, wrong. on but their that's, side that's as well. Wrong. Yeah, but that's yeah. that's the part that I'm trying right. to overcome. It's like, right. man, forever I thought there was a sign hanging outside the church door that said, no questions allowed. Check your brain at the door when you come in. That's got to be, look, if we're going to stop the mass exit of our youth from leaving the church, our youth pastors have to be geared up to answer their questions. I'll say that again. Our youth pastors need to be geared up to answer their questions. Now, I'm not saying that every youth pastor should be an apologist because we're all called to a different thing. But, man, you better know how to get the answers. You better know the resources to, to go to. But you can't just look at them and say, oh, I don't know, just, just have faith. That doesn't work anymore, man. That maybe have worked for hundreds of years or decades before us, but it doesn't work anymore. You can't just look at them and say, just have faith because it doesn't work. They, they, right. they have got to have something given to them to sustain. I have a saying, if you, if you don't know why you believe what you believe, your what is useless. You can say, I believe that Christianity is true, but if you don't know why, that it's true is useless to you. No wonder why they're leaving, because they have nothing to substantiate their faith. Right, right. So, yeah, I was just pointing out that I know there, there are still, we, we disapprove of it, but there are still uh, churches that will say that to the youth, you know, don't ask these questions, just have faith. But what we're seeing here from this video clip that you just played is it's the same is true with the, the other religion of Darwinism. There are yeah, questions you can't ask. Yeah. Right. Glad you said religion.
just just believe without faith. I mean, just have faith in in yeah. in, in Darwinism. Yeah. Uh, the other thing um, uh, that to uh, you were talking about in your testimony, how you saw that the evidence lined up with, well, I, you know, I don't know if you, you, you said it, but for me, it was that I saw that the, the description we find in, in the Bible, the Christian description of reality lines up with what I've experienced in reality. So yeah. in the example you just gave, you know, the Bible says the, the creation is cursed. We see, uh, you know, everywhere things are tending downward. We see yeah. decay and, and death. And even in the we see genetic drift yeah. and you know we're, we're accumulating more and more genetic errors than yeah. our ancestors had so this can't go on forever but you know no. so so things the oil word is going down but but in darwinism it has to go up against the tide of entropy which well, is what we see i was just going to say you're talking about the second second law of thermodynamics entropy which states that everything's going from a state of order to disorder and if your viewers don't understand what that means, I always use a simple one. If I spray perfume in the air, its molecular structure, when I first spray it, is perfect. It's the way it was designed. But after five, 10 minutes, you can't even smell it anymore because its molecular structure begins to break down. And when it breaks down, because it's going from a state of order to disorder, then when it breaks down, you can barely smell it anymore. I got either good news or bad news, depending on what your faith is. If, if you don't know how Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, this is bad news. If you do, it's good news. We're all dying. From the moment we were born, we've begun to absorb diseases into our body until finally what death is, is an accumulation of enough diseases that shuts the process of living down because we are breaking down. We are we were born and now we're breaking down. The, the magnetic uh, field is, is wearing down. The sun's uh, energy is burning out. We, it's not just a centralized problem. It's a universal problem. And I say problem. What I mean is it's a universal truth that entropy exists everywhere. So if everything's going from a state of order to disorder, how does, and I include this in my talk, how does evolution get away with saying, first of all, you can't get non-living chemicals to turn into living cells and then turn into multicellular complex organisms like we are going in this upward direction when everything in science is saying we're going in a downward direction and we can observe that mutations again break down and come with a cost everything is going in the opposite direction scientifically not the, people say well the bible doesn't correspond to science i'm like are you kidding me because man right now science is saying everything's going the complete different direction than what they need it to do they need it to get smarter and we're getting dumber. Our bodies are breaking down. Like you said, our, our ancestors had better genetics than we do because we are constantly breaking down. Every single generation that comes along is genetically a little bit worse off than it was in the generation before it. We're, we're not getting any better. And you can say, well, years ago, people lived to be you know, 50, 60 years old, and now we're living to be 70 or 80. Well, that's because we got a lot of good medicine. It's, 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 it's postponing the inevitable diseases because we've got this medicine that we can take for supplements and stuff, which is great. I'm not, nothing wrong with medicine, but that doesn't, if you take away all the medicine, we'd probably be living 30 or 40 years versus 50 or 60 years because we're just breaking down. Right. Yeah. That, that, that helped convince me as well to see that um, that description matches with reality on, on one of those slides, you had an uh, URL RFH. ORH.com. What is that? Yep. Our, that is, uh, it's short for Reasons for Hope, which is the name of the ministry that I'm a part of. Um, RFORH.com. It's very easy to, to remember. Um, okay. Go there. You can find out all the information about us and stuff. But but as I said, the, the, the website's great. It's got everything up there. But man, because we carry these things with us everywhere we go, you know, download the app. And when you're out and uh, two, two things, when you're out and about, and a question comes up, you don't quite have the answer, <coughs> or you want to bring up a conversation and don't know how to start it, go to the app, play the video, or, or we've got all kinds of, we're a content heavy ministry, um, play the information and then that gives you a starting point. But here's the crazy thing. You really want to like be blown away. The original concept behind starting these debunks and the fast facts and all these things, we wanted parents to sit down with their kids, watch this three to five minute, or some of them are 60 seconds. Um, sit down with your kids, watch the video, and then take these things and put them over here. Don't get on them and have a conversation with your kids about what you just watched. 
And, and I'm telling you, man, when I was in Nigeria not too long ago, kids don't have smartphones and parents spend time with their kids. It was a completely different thing. And the kids were honorable, respectable. They respected their parents. It was. And so then I was at a, a, a Christian homeschool conference in Wisconsin a couple of weeks ago. Again, same concept. You got Nigeria, you got America, same concept. No smartphones. Parents invested in their kids' lives. They spent time with their kids and the kids were completely different. And we wonder what's wrong with this generation of kids that's coming up. Take a stab at, at per week um, or per, yeah, per week, how many hours a parent spend face to face with their kids. And, and, and we'll time. Take a stab at it. Oh, um, me? Yeah. How many hours? Okay. Here, here in the U.S.? Yep. Mm, four or five. And you're right on point. Three and a half hours. Think about that, man. Think about, think about how many hours they're on their smartphone getting access to information that some's true and some's not their brains aren't developed enough to sit and think about critically think about what's true and what's not. They're still growing up. We're supposed we're supposed to be raising them. The phones are raising them. Their friends are raising them and the parents are spending three and a half hours per week face to face. I'm like, no wonder we're going downhill. Like, no wonder entropy is in our families because we've allowed entropy in our families, man. We're our family structure is breaking down. So I would right. encourage anybody who's watching right now, like, man, you can change that. You don't just because that's a stat doesn't I, I'm glad statistics exist and you got to be careful where you're getting from. But the one thing I love about them is if they're coming from a, a clean source. Stats don't lie. They are what they are. That doesn't mean they have to be the truth, though. We can we're, we can reverse the trend. We can we can switch that around, man. Right. And, and the other thing is, you know, what you were saying, uh, the parents spend so little time with them, but they spend a lot of time in school where they're being brainwashed, as we yeah. discussed before, you know, being taught these evolutionary ideas and the secular worldview. Yeah. And I think not only that, but our culture has also convinced the parents that they, they can't, they're, they're not equipped to, to raise their own children. Better to send them to the school and let the school do it. We, you've outsourced Ooh. your parenting, but yeah. parents do have a tremendous eff effect on, on their kids. And they need to be reminded of that, that you know, even though they might be teaching them something um, inappropriate in school, you can, you can countermand that by what you teach them at home. So good well, advice. Think about this, man. There are parts of my dad that drove me crazy. And later on in life, I didn't emulate what I learned in school as part of my behavioral pattern. I unfortunately ended up emulating some of what my dad had because we emulate that which is in front of us. And our parents are so pivotal and who we turn into and in, in, as an adult because of that time that that they're actually even even though you're, you might not be spending more than three and a half hours FaceTime, you're still the biggest part of your kid's life. And so kids are emulating what their parents are doing, whether they know it or not. And so, you know, if a parent's, if a parent doesn't have a priority on Christ, why would their kids, even if you send them to Christian school, because I do a lot of Christian schools and I'm telling you, Christian schools are just as bad off as secular schools are. They're not a whole lot there. There's a few of them that I won't mention that are, that are top notch, man. I, I think the world of them, some of the other ones that I go to, man, they're just, the kids are doing the exact same thing because you can send them to school and the school is trying to build character into them, but man, the parents, and I agree with you, the school is actually teaching all these falsehoods and that's becoming part of what they are, but more so than anything, they pick up those characteristics of their parents because that's the way that God's designed the family to be. And so parents, you have to, you have to watch yourself. <coughs> How is your walk with Christ? Is baseball practice that interferes with Wednesday night service more important than Wednesday night service? Do you really think little Bobby's going to have a chance at being MLB? Not saying he won't, but the chances of him becoming MLB are slim to none. The chances he's going to stand before Christ one day is a thousand percent. So what's more important in the grand scheme of things? I wish I wish we had the backbone for parents to stand up and go like, hey, Coach John, we're not practicing on Wednesday nights, man. You know that's when we have youth services, you know, and but we don't. We don't stand up against that. I, I have a thing called Equip Retreat, which uh, this year we're doing two of them. Next year we got five of them. It's a uh, it's an apologetics youth camp that you get the whole the whole experience of, of camp meeting. Like there's zip lines and rock walls and jeeps and horses and lakes and blah blah blah. You get the whole. I don't want to rob a kid of their their summer camp experience. 
But man, when when we take them there, we teach them apologetics in the day and two, three sessions of apologetics during the day, which we, we end up making them take ownership of the information towards the end of the week. And at night we hit, so that's during the day we hit them in the head and at night we hit them in the heart and we connect those two together. And I started that because, man, I kept sending my son to camp and he would come home and be like, oh, Jesus was awesome. And I'd be like, but what did you get out of it? Oh, Jesus is awesome. But what was, what was your big takeaway? And three days later, it was like, he never even went to camp. So I tried to do that, but I look at it like this. We send our kids to, to church on Wednesday nights, whatever it is, because our priority is not, it's not where it should be. Meaning like, you know, if baseball camp gets involved with a quip, you know, this year we had to go to 325, which I, I it's a little bit of a raise. We, we, we don't make anything off of it. We just charge what it costs us to put it on and cost of everything went up. So it's 325. But man, it's a six day camp with everything included, all the food, all the lodging, everything's taken care of 325 bucks for six days. I get world renowned apologists to come in and, and be with me and help show into these kids. But if a base, they're like, well, I can't afford that. Whoa, 325. But if some like some dude who played baseball back in like 1984 and nobody knows his name, but man, he played major league baseball. He's having a camp. For two days, that's 550 bucks, and little Bobby can go to a camp where some unknown Major League Baseball failure dude is having. They're like, man, dish out the 550 bucks because Bobby's got to go and learn from the MLB failure. It's just we've got to get our priorities straight. And, and, and I liken it back to, man, when I coach baseball, you drop your kid off with me for a couple minutes, you know, and that's about all I get with them. And I kept telling you, if you don't practice catching with them when you get home, they're not going to be able to catch the ball, you know. And and they would they would come into to the game, and their kids would be terrible, and they'd be looking at me like, "What's wrong?" And I'm like, "How much did you spend time with them at home?" So, anyways, I I'm beating up a dead horse, but I just really it, it hit me over the last year that man, we can try and reach the next generation as much as we want, but if parents don't step into the game, not a whole lot you can do, man. Especially for the poor youth pastors who are given like, you know, an hour and a half per week. And they're like, can you change my kid? And I'm like, no, I can't. You're, you're giving your kid three and a half hours FaceTime. They get an hour and a half with me. That's a total of five hours. Like they're on their phone for six hours, seven, eight hours at a time being raised by the Internet. And whatever, whatever that opinion says to them, it's like, no, I can't. I can't help you. You need to help yourself. Yeah, I, I feel like I was kind of raised by the television set back before there were phones. Yeah, um, that's what I spent a lot of my time doing. I learned most of my morals and ethics from Gilligan's Island. <laughs> 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 All right, so so we're talking about Darwin versus Moses. Can you give us another example of the contrast? Because I love the contrast between the two. Absolutely, absolutely. Let me. Uh, I'll, we'll. We'll. Uh, are we going till seven? What What is the? Uh... Um. Yeah, we can we can go longer unless you know if you got to go, then we'll, we'll cut it short. Well, uh, we'll, we'll come to. I've got yeah. roast beef cooking, and it's okay. like, it's making the whole house stink. And I'm like, oh. I'm, I'm starting to I'm starting this like weird. I don't want to call it diet. It's supposed to be like a lifestyle change on Monday. So I'm like, all right, what do I want to eat before this happens? Like, I gotta oh, I gotta finish man. eating all the all the. Have we had any any comments or anything on the on YouTube? Uh, Lamb Goat Soup says, I agree that we need to go to youth service, but they should support the children in the name of Jesus, like giving a glass of water. So I guess they need to drink that living water. Yes, they do. Absolutely. All right. So this is um, this is probably if I had um, if I had one argument that somebody gave me and said, how how can you uh, how can you disprove evolution? How can you prove um that God exists and all that stuff. This is probably the one that I, because remember we were, it's important to remember that we were talking about mechanisms. Is there, can you give me any uh, one single mechanism that adds information to the human genome and a mutational process? Those are called mechanisms. Can you add a, is there a mechanism that we can observe that can do something? And so this particular mechanism that, that I'm about to share with you, it's my favorite argument because there's not an atheist in the world that, that can, uh, that can actually answer this, this mechanism problem. And uh, we're, we're back to origin of species. And, um, and I, and I love this because this preservation of favorable variants and rejection of the injurious variations, I call natural selection. Darwin is saying this, I'm going to inject intelligence because what is behind the preservation or rejection? Who's doing that? You can, you, you know what I'm saying? Like he's, he's, 
inadvertently admitting that there has to be intelligence in this process, even though he doesn't want to admit that he's inadvertently doing that when in the origin of species, when he says this preservation and rejection, well, what is, what is the mechanism known for doing that? There, there is no mechanism. Well, Moses says, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. And on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. So you've got Moses, Darwin over here is saying, look, through millions and billions of mutations, we're on an upward climb to, to not just within a species have these different variations that are, that are, uh, that are beneficial, but we also have speciation jumping from one species to the next within this process. Moses is like, dude, none of that has time to do it because God said he did it in six days and then, the, and then he finished and he was done. And so we've got two completely different opposing views here. One, it took millions of years, billions of years and billions and billions of mutations or Moses is like, no, God did it in six days. He's done. And so we're going to unpack that. And I always ask people, like, what do you what do you see when you see this? What do you what do you guys think of that? <laughs> pretty yeah, awesome, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty wild. I don't I have it. any I don't have any artistic ability. If I got Photoshop, I'm pretty good with Photoshop. But you give me like a pen and a piece of paper. I'm pretty, pretty bad at um, at, at art. This is sidewalk art. Oh, this, I get this it chalk art on sidewalk. Wow. So, so, I mean, I, I would say, you know, I, I get people when I'm giving this talk, they're like, it's colors, it's, it's beautiful. It's artistic. You know, I get all this stuff. And I said, well, let me, let me give you, let me give you an illustration. I said, what if I had sidewalk chalk? And then what if I, what if I brought in some wind and then I combine some rain with the wind. And so I've got chalk that lands on the ground and then, rain starts dissolving the chalk into the concrete or the, or the asphalt. And then wind blows the disintegrating chalk around and it forms this. Do you believe me? No, not going to form a <laughs> picture. You're, you're, you're logical. You, you know that that's not going to happen. But what if I said millions of years and billions of, of chests of chalk spilled out and monsoon rains and gusts of winds and tornadoes and hurricanes blew the chalk around the sidewalk and formed this. Would you believe me? Never going to happen. <laughs> because you're logical. You know that it takes the mind of an artist to create these things. It, it, it takes the mind of an artist to organize colors into these patterns that we call artwork. You're not just going to walk up on that and go, wow. That's a great accident. Any more than if you were walking along the beach and you you saw John loves Mary in a heart, you'd be like, wow, you see how that wave carved that into the sand? Like these are illogical positions that we take when we say that something like this could accidentally happen over mutations and over millions and billions of years and billions of mutations. These can accidentally happen any more than John loves Mary can happen with a wave coming over the shore. And so applying that same logic when we for the chalk, Describe what you're about to see to me. Like you tell me, I'm going to pop it up here, and I just want you to start telling me what you see. I see letters and numbers. Okay. Organization of colors. Mm -hmm. I would even say beautiful. Some of them are pretty. Very, very. I'm a tie dye guy, so some of them are really, really colorful. Do you know what they are? Well, we I see the alphabet in order from the yep. beginning. A through Z, and then yeah. one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. These things are in sequence. Okay. What are they, though? They're butterfly wings. Sanved oh. traveled the world, and he captured these different butterflies. And look, <laughs> look at the detail of the eyes on that one. I'll go back to this just so you can see. Those are all butterfly wings. Oh, wow. Wow. That's I know. Wow. Isn't that crazy? And like I said, look at the detail of the eyes on that one and the happy face and the heart and the singing choir. Now, here's the question. If millions of years and millions of boxes of chalk and rain and monsoon winds and everything else couldn't organize colors into patterns, then why is it that when we look through creation, we see colors that are in patterns that create things that could have otherwise not been done without some sort of a mechanism to do it? Just like adding information to the genome 
where's the mechanism? Where is the mechanism that creates these things? And and I, I've got people know I collect these. And so they send me these things. And I'm like, look at these flowers. Like that looks like a little man inside of the flower. Or what, what about this? It's, it's like a like a giraffe looking thing. And that's bad. <laughs> and a that's a monkey orchid is what that is. What about this one? That looks like the that the dove with the fig leaf, you know, when it came mm-hmm. back. How about this one? Barrel of monkeys, anyone? Barrel of monkeys? Oh, that's cute. And look, these are all monkey orchids. Now, here's wow. now, now we have two options for any of this. And I've got more, but there's two options. Either A, evolution accidentally produced all of these things. Because remember, Darwin was saying there's something that preserves the, the, but it's only preservation for the survival of the fittest. It, these have nothing to do with survival of the fittest. There's nothing that's gained by these organizing themselves into different colors and patterns and stuff like that for the preservation of the of the race. It, it, it has nothing to do with that. So either A, evolution just happened to accidentally preserve all of these different things. Those lips are real, by the way. I, you can look those up and, and see that. But look, at you can't be afraid of spiders anymore. Look at this, look at the spiders. That is the happiest spider I've ever seen up on the top right. That is the happiest yeah. spider. Ever. And that's grass. That's a particular grass that's under a microscope. Look at all the happy faces. And you got wow. Darth all over there. So my point is this. What is it that there could possibly be within evolutionary models to explain the organization of colors and patterns? Or... God's first name in the Bible is Elohim. In the beginning, God created as Bira Sheath Bedel Elohim in the in the Hebrew. Elohim literally translated means creator. Could it be that God, the creator of the universe, tweaked his creation in order that we would see his fingerprints all over everything that exists? And and I Frank Turk wrote that book. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist with Norm Geisler. Mm-hmm. I don't have enough faith to believe that those things, because I've got more. I just, I, you know, like I said, people have, I've been doing this for years and people know that I collect those types of pictures. So they'll send me all these different things where it's like creation cries out the evidence of Elohim. It just cries out the evidence of Elohim. So it's either more believable that evolution accidentally got it right or Elohim created it with his fingerprints so that no cre- nobody would be without excuse. You can't look at creation in an honest perspective and say there's nothing behind that. So that's one of my favorite arguments where I compare what Darwin says versus what Moses says. We look at the evidence available to us now and, and say, we, who got it right? Looks to me like, man, in six days, God created everything. He said it was good. It was very good. He was finished with his work. There was no explanation with an evolutionary theory for organizing any of those colors into patterns that we see there's none that's why i love the argument so much because it's such a strong argument to say you provide for me the brain work behind it and i'll be an evolutionist in the meantime i'm creating i'm, I'm celebrating creation all right i like that all right that's a good argument hey we haven't heard from jody much you've been in and out so in and out. With jody what's up you're um i'm not hearing you <laughs> yeah, we're just getting the mime act. <laughs> Did you turn on your audio? Jody the mime. He's. It says his phone is connected to audio. Okay, he's Very gone good. and coming back on another device. He must be driving out in Timbuktu or something. Oh, yeah, he's always out in the boonies. Jody, uh, now you're muted. All right. There you go. Well, I, I'm back. I'm back. Good to see you again. But, um, well, I've enjoyed the Good, good to be back again. Hopefully, <laughs> I will be in a better area next on our next program. I hope I'll be in a better area. Amen. And by the way, you, I nominate you. Can you hear me? I nominate something. Oh, I nominate you for the best beard on our program. <laughs> <laughs> it just happens all by itself. <laughs> yeah. But. But, uh, yeah, a great program. I've got a lot of atheist friends. I'm hoping they're listening. I did encourage them to listen because I really don't, you know, based on the evidence or based on the overwhelming evidence, uh, I cannot believe in evolution. Like you said, no, show no. me the evidence, show me the mind behind it, or show me something that is logical, and I'll believe it. But, you know, the Bible and science to me makes a whole lot more sense than you know saying that 
you know, we came, you know, uh, from, you know, you know, evolution. It just makes a lot more sense to me. Hey there, doggy. He's getting his 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> Who is this? That All is right. me. That's, that's our little puppy. Cute one. You can't, can't tell that evolution you can't produced. Tell, you can't tell which way he's looking because he looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we leave, I want to put up some uh, resources that I recommend to folks. Oh, where did they go? I had a window open. Well, there Jody, I, I would say to your evolutionary friends, like if evolution were true, then shouldn't shouldn't this be like what we find? And I'll, I'll, I, I think this is what this is what we should find, right? I mean, right. I mean, if, if it were true, where are where are the tra transitional evidences? I just, yeah. I would love to, I would love to see them sometime because I can't find them anywhere. I keep asking for them, but can't find any. You know, Dave, right. uh, in exactly. that last in that last segment, you were talking exactly. about how there is an intelligence to the rejection or to the creation that we see. I noticed that even the evolutionary evolutionists use this language that indicates. The intelligence behind the creation they talk about codes and transcription well that's and what i'm saying when he says the preservation or rejection what's mm -hmm. behind preserving or rejecting there's got to be an agent that is preserving or rejecting these these mutations that's that's intelligence like I, call it natural selection okay who's behind natural selection because the preservation and rejection isn't is, is it's intelligence right I, 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 to your friends that, that Jody, if, if they're if they're watching, and I hope maybe they, if they're not watching now, you can you can send this to them. They can watch later. From my heart, I promise you, Christianity is true. I, I I didn't believe it for thirty years, and for thirty years I tried to find ultimate meaning. And I'm just telling you, you owe it to yourself to investigate. Don't listen to what I'm saying. I I wouldn't have listened to what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is man, put in the research, put in the time. Don't just believe what you believed when you were 12 and then you live that out for the rest of your life. Look into it and test it. Test it and see if it's true. Test everything. Test Islam. Test test whatever it is that you think may or may not be the truth. Test it because you owe it to yourself to do that because if you will, I'm telling you, you will find God in it. I promise you. He's not hiding. He's right out there in the open. It's just we don't look. Yes, good advice because it's your eternal life that's on the line. Right. Yeah. And it's we, your now life. It's it's yeah, it's now true. peace, joy, contentment. It's those things. It's not just eternity. It's like man, now is the day. You know. Yes, we get, we have eternal life and we have it now in Christ. Amen. We believe these things because of the evidence. That's why yeah. we're talking about things. That's why we have lots of videos on science on our channel. We yeah, also amen. had Buzz Rana talking about evolution. And we'll do more uh, later. Robert says, adaptation is something I can get behind for sure. But evolution from soup doesn't have enough evidence, in my opinion. Too many missing links. Right? Yep. They're all missing. Yep. <laughs> no, I, no, adaptation? You know, when my dad moved from Connecticut, he had lived in Connecticut his whole life, moved to Florida. Six months later, if it dropped below 68, he was freezing. I'm like, dude, you grew up in four foot of snow. What do you mean you're cold at 68? His body just went through an adaptation, man. Just like those dogs that I use with the LLSS, his body went. I at, we we go through adaptations all the time. I'm I'm going through adaptations all, all the time. I mean, it's just part of life. It's part of what happens, and so I don't I don't doubt that. But you know, that's why that's why the the sticky wicket for a Christian's argument when it comes to this is: are they are the can the mutations be beneficial? Yes, beneficial doesn't mean new. It's not new information, and that's the that's the slippery slope that the evolutionist walks down. As they say, because it was beneficial, that means it's new information that makes it. No, the beneficial came at a loss every single time. Right, that's the question to ask about Darwinism. Where does the information come from? Show me yeah. the mechanism. Yeah. So the uh, resources that I wanted to recommend uh, this book by Johnson, "Defeating Darwinism by Opening Minds," it's a short little book, easy read. Uh, not heavy on the science for those who are not, um, you know, uh, uh, don't have a, don't feel for the science. Now, this book is much thicker. It's really big and very technical, but Darwin's Doubt by Stephen C. Meyer is also a good one. Darwin's Black Box, very scientific, uh, Michael yeah. Behe's book. 
these are the things that, and, and then the classic evolution and theory in crisis, although there's a, a newer version, uh, still in crisis. <laughs> so these are some things that I recommend. Uh, Brother Dave, do you have anything other than the websites, which will be in the, the link? Yeah, go to our website. I mean, Carl's got a, uh, Carl's got a book, uh, uh, Lucy, the, uh, it, I'm, you know, the biggest icon of all time, and it, it's a missing Missing yeah. link, Lucy. And um, if you get my book, How, Why, Where, when I'm addressing the how part, how do we get here? I deal with it in a very simple way, but I just, I, I tear apart the idea that we got here from evolutionary processes. There's just no way that's possible. And it, it, look, there's only two options. Either, either A, we got here by evolutionary processes, or B, God did it. And that's not the God of the gaps. It's just the truth. You have either A or B. And if evolution cannot be true, which I show in my book, it cannot be true, then there's only one other option. There has to be a God who did it. And so I would challenge anybody to, to read that and, and, and walk away with a better understanding. It's called how, why, where, how do we get here? Why are we here? Where do we go when we die? Um, but like I said, our, our resources are all over the place when it comes to the app or the, or the uh, website. If, if there's anything I can do personally to help and, and anybody's faith walk and, and stuff, just uh, reach out through the website or through the app and I'll do everything I can. Okay. Someone in the chat asked for all those links. I'll put them in the description box. And for those who are watching live, I'll send you a, a, a copy as well. Jody, why don't you uh, read us out? Well, uh, just uh, keep us in your prayers. Uh, please subscribe to the channel. And share this video with your evolutionist friends, share it with your Christian friends, because we need to know how to defend our faith. We need to know how people to believe Christianity because I say it's true. I want you to believe Christianity because it is true. Why should you believe in God? Because God is true. That's why you should believe in God. But we got the evidence to back that up. So uh, please subscribe to our channel, Disciples of YHWH in Christ, and uh, like it, share it, and keep us in your prayers. Uh, hey, thanks so much, Dave, for being on the show. It was uh, really fun talking to you. Uh, I love your energy and your heart for the next generation and you know debunking uh, evolution. So nice. Uh, it was a great show. Thank you, and we hope to see you again. Thank you for having me on here. Maybe we can work out another time in the, in the future. All right. Thank you all for